who would you go into coalition with? <laughs> <laughs> So that's assuming, fast forward, there's a few of us as MPs, or even just now, and we need what we need to create another coalition. Yeah, I imagine we have another result, um, and you've got two potential, you've got Labour and Conservatives, both sitting on the best part of, I don't know, 290 seats apiece. Uh, and um, the ticket group, whatever you're going to be called by then, is sitting on 20 or 30. Which side do you fall on? Okay, so I'll answer that part first and then come to the bit earlier, which I think was about looking basically, wasn't it? Um, so first and foremost, um, we're not a party yet, so these sorts of decisions are in a blissful position of not having to have a, you know, a kind of policy on them. My instinct on the latter question is it would depend who was the Prime Minister, who was the leader of that group, um, and what their policies were. You know, if it right here and now, and it's still Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might go and run a pub again. <laughs> and just open the doors. Boris Johnson and Tom Watson. Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 like Desert Island. Kiss, kiss, kiss Mary Snob. <laughs> Oh no, dance, Marisol. Uh, kill, no, kill, Marisol, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, kissing and snogging. Um, that's an impossible question, um, genuinely. You, you, would, you would go, or we would go, with wherever we felt um, there was an open door to listening and allowing us to modify their position, I suppose. Um, my instinct is, probably that would be Boris. But you know what? <laughs> yeah, it's not going to get to that. Um, so your earlier question, though, about to think about whipping, basically. Um, I would hope, given that um, our, um, so first and foremost, the sorts of candidates, the sort of people we have standing, would absolutely have to meet our expectations about values, professional content. You know, we're building like an HR policy at the minute. You don't have that in political parties, can you believe it or not? Code of conduct, standards. You know, in any job, you would have that, wouldn't you? What we expect of you as an employee, what's the complaint procedure? So we're building, it's kind of dull stuff, but we're building it because we want to get it right. So all the candidates would meet our expectations in terms of behaviour, but I would hope very much that the hard whipping that we experience now would not be there. There will be a whip, there has to be, because it's a coordinating thing, um, because a lot of topics, you know, I'm not ashamed to say, I'm not an expert on defence. So if I'm asked to vote on something in defence, then I probably won't have done my research as thoroughly as if it's on welfare, for example. Um, so you need to trust within your party that they've thought about it and this is the right way to go. Um, but if it was matters of conscience or really big items, then absolutely I would hope that there would be three votes. Because that's how you get um, the right answer. Um, should, we, should we do a couple, maybe? It's, um, if I keep them on one side to make it into the microphone, there's Chris there, and then there's Jennifer in the blue top further along. And then we'll come down here and then pass it across. Uh, thanks very much, Heidi. I just wondered if you could let us know what's happening in terms of your constituency MP arrangements, uh, what staff you've got, what office you've got, um, you know, what your feedback mechanisms are now for constituents yeah. and, uh, and anything else that might be relevant. Yeah, that's a valid point, actually. Um, so the, the, the great news is, as an MP, and this is another reason about the by-election question, that the person is elected, it's the person and the party. And IPSA, who are the expenses people, they're very clear uh, as, a, as a matter of course that as an MP, your office, your staff is funded by the taxpayer, by you. So it is apolitical, which is why you know I help uh, as a, a constituent MP if you vote Green, if you vote UK, however you might vote, I represent you. So my office, it's funding, my staff, none of that changes at all. My email address, hi, you are Alan MP, it's the same as it always has been, still in Hardwick. Um, I am looking to move, I don't have to, but the building is shared with the Conservative Association, so it feels kind of right that I should probably be in a new place. <laughs> and they're not throwing me out, because um, I have my own landlord, it's not them, but, um, but nonetheless, I am looking. If anybody's got any premises, I'm sure. It's okay, but for five miles around Campbell, we do. Um, but in terms of um, contacting me on my telephone numbers, all of that stays exactly the same. Actually, it's probably worth mentioning, if there are people here today who do want to get involved, and we'll have some sign-up sheets at the end, um, to help me build a team, you'll notice that I have separate email addresses, things like support at heidiallen.co.uk. So my Westminster, my paid, taxpayer paid staff don't touch that stuff at all, which is where I, I rely on people like Harriet helping me, because it's very important. Taxpayer funded is constituency MP 
political and campaigning. I have to get my legs to help me. So it's separate. And then another gentleman there with a the blue jumper on. Thank you, Heidi. Ian Rawley here. Can I say first how amazingly refreshing it is that you have a politician who actually has the courage of her convictions? Many of us will appreciate the enormity of what you've done in terms of breaking out of this tribalism. And I commend you for it personally. Thank you. I think it must have been a very brave moment when you said, I'm going to do it. Whatever people think about that, thank you for having the courage of convictions. As you say, and this leads me on to my question, it's like David and Goliath. And I, my question, therefore, is, um, could you give us any timeline, any approximate timeline, um, in terms of when you think a new party might be uh, available for us to vote for? I mean, you, as you rightly say, it's a massive undertaking. We've no idea when the next election might come. Um, could you perhaps give us a, a, a small indication of what you're thinking is at the moment? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, Brexit is kind of <laughs> keeping our attention a little bit at the moment. It's a bit hectic. If you've been watching the news this week, you'll realise. Um, but in general terms, so, so me personally here in South Cambridge, I want to start now building a team. Um, I want to get a leaflet out to all my constituents, explaining what I've done and why. And that, you know, like Chris's point, very, very important point that people know that it's not coming to me, we've got issues. And I'm going to need some volunteers to help me deliver that. So me, I'm starting immediately. More formally as a party, so our hope is to get our bus on the road, um, sort of late spring, summer, and to go out and build that manifesto um, with a hope to be, I mean, we're already in touch with the Electoral Commission, we're learning all the rules of what you can and you can't do. It's quite an onerous position, um, process to go through, actually. It's not just a form and sign your name. They want your governance, how you're going to conduct financial matters. There's an awful lot of, rightly so, procedural stuff that you have to prove to them that you're up to the mark. So our ambition is to be forming as a party probably autumn, something like that. Um, I would be disappointed if it was much later than that. Brexit is a complicating factor, factor and it is likely to not diverting our attention. Um, I'm just living there, I'm not 25 hours in a day. And it's quite hard just wading through the enormity of what we're dealing with at the moment. But that's a rough kind of time scale. Certainly anybody that has local elections in May, we don't have them in South Camden, you know, we had them last year, but some parts of the country do. We're not fielding candidates there, for example. Your elections could be a more pressing deadline, and as I mentioned, perhaps... Yeah. Oh, it's Chris, are you finished, Sam? No, Queen Edith's Queen Edith's Oh, you're right, absolutely. You're right. Of course, it's city. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right, <I need> <laughs> um, but yeah, your elections, I think, would be the big possibility, uh, and then I, I think we'd be dark if we didn't have some kind of loose alignment with independent candidates. But yeah, as a proper formal party, with an aim still to be decided, um, probably autumn time. Quick as we're able to, really. Right, any more questions? There's one, there's, should we take these two gentlemen here, and then we'll move across the side. Peter Allen, no relation. <laughs> in the past, when the country's been in crisis, we've had governments of national unity. Why not today? I couldn't agree more with you. Two words, Theresa May. Okay, because she is hanging on. And I don't, honestly, I don't generally think through any ego driven power thing. But she is relentless in her determination to see this through. And in a way, you've got to admire that. Yeah, but it needs to be flexible. And, and this is the difficulty that we're having. I, um, I won't go into, if you'll forgive me, I won't go into too much detail about some plans we've got for this week. Um, but it would appear that meaningful vote three, it's like Rambo, isn't it? <laughs> meaningful vote two, return, <laughs> try again. Um, meaningful vote three, we think, might come back this week, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, so we're going to our plans around that. Can you call it meaningless vote? Meaningless vote. That reminds me of the misguided this way. Um, <laughs> that's our own agency. 
But um, I think, depending on if, if we're successful with what we want to try and achieve this week, I think it might well grab power away from them. Because as you'll know, we've been trying this. The bowls, let win, Cooper, whatever you want to call these very amend various amendments that have been flying around, and essentially sought. Because the government, um, control, what they call controls the order paper. The order paper is today's business and what we're debating and how we're voting. And that when um, the way out of works, the the works, the government has control of that. And all these amendments that we've failed to get through so far um, would essentially give Parliament the power for one day, or whatever we managed to, to legislate for. And that would allow us to take that away and allow us to have these indicative votes that we keep talking about. Um, people's vote, we'll see. Um, I'll come back again this week. People vote too. Come back this week, um, but yes, I would agree. If I was her, <coughs> I, but then I would have done that two years ago. Yeah, to be honest, but um, but you're, I, I can disagree more. And I, I do sometimes wonder whether Amber Rudd might somehow come out of the woodwork and, and leave that. So that's the kind of coalition of it, you know. Never mind, would it be Tom Watson and Boris, but Amber Rudd and the team, you know, we, I, th I think Brexit could and should catalyze different ways of working. It's just a bit messy and not happening as quickly as I think that. And then definitely that. Thank you. It's uh, Richard Meany, um, great show. I um, just wanted to obviously echo think, a number of people, and uh, my congratulations for what you've done, and um, again, thank you all the way. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, looking at the, the centre ground of politics mm -hmm. at the moment, and there may well be a number of people in the room here who have been either members or, or very closely following the Liberal Democrats on the basis of. Brexit and, and just trying to find somewhere to, to, to settle with regard to, to values and so on. Um, I'd be interested in, and I appreciate it would be a work in progress, but I'd be, I'd be interested in what conversations have happened with um, the likes of Vince, with the likes of Joe Swinson. Um, and clearly, coming back to some of the points on tribalism, I can fully appreciate that they will be very reluctant to, um, to, to proactively do anything that would essentially disband their own political unit. Um, and their own tribe, so to speak. But I think, you know, pragmatically, there has to be a sense that um, if you are going to find a foothold in the short term, you really have to pull together in that centre ground. Um, and I'd be really interested in what conversations have happened already and what conversations are planned coming, coming forward. So the good news, there's lots of good news on lots of levels there. Um, any of you that know me since day one, I've never acted politically locally. I've always had and uh, enjoyed very good relationships with our councils of any stripe or colour, which has um, come and oh, just see that <laughs> um, And I've done, which has come home. It feels to roost. Well, the first people who got in touch with me was Bridget, who's our leader of the South Camp Council. I've had um, councils from city wards or local constituency get in touch um, and sort of wish me well. So already there's a very good rapport locally, um, and. Nationally, yes, we're talking to Vince and Joe and Norman and the whole team. Uh, and they are looking, formally, about how we work together moving forward. And what's been great about the response, um, which I've been so impressed with from the Lib Dems nationally, because yeah, I'm having like text message conversations and coffee with Vince. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, but yeah, it's going, isn't it, in May, as we've learned, it's not going in May. Um, what I've been really impressed with is, no, well, you've got to come over to our gang. It's been, what's important here? Centre ground politics. All the support. For whatever reason, our brand hasn't gone well recently, nationally at least, it's been very well here lately because we've been here last year, but it's not about that. Whereas the Tories and Labour are, my, I'm red, I'm blue, they just can't let go of that. But the Lib Dems have not behaved like that at all. Mm. And so to give you an idea, so many of you may know if you're Lib Dem members, um, there's your spring conference next week, or is it this week? It's, it's soon. And Anna Subri is going up to talk at one of their events. I'm doing a live FaceTime. Um, actually, I should learn how to do that, given that I don't know how to switch microphone on. <laughs> 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 no, Facebook, even. FaceTime. Facebook Live thing with Joe Swinson this week. So we're already starting to work together. So nobody can quite predict how it's going to end up. Um, one thing I would say, we are not morphing into the Lib Dems because we have this belief, fresh start, no baggage, no brand issues, no, no nobody's at the, the big G's. We're all equals, we start together. So um, there may be something new that emerges together, but we need to work our way through that very sympathetically. We all want our members and history and all of the good stuff that makes parties up, but it's been nothing but positive so far. 
Bit of mean now, so I'll go and burn my Um, uh, if Theresa May wins meaningful vote three next week, does that mean it's game over for all of us who want to stop Brexit? So, meaningful vote three, I, I know, I sense that people are sort of thinking it's going to go through, principally because the ERG are really splintering. I don't think it will. As I say, there are things I'm not going to discuss publicly that we have um, some plans for this week. Um, to assist us with that not happening. Um, but even if it, even if it, and I, don't, I really don't think it will, I really don't think it will get through genuinely. Um, but even if it did, and, and I'm sure most of you are aware of it, but I wonder if everyone is, even if it did get through, this is just the beginning of the negotiations actually. <laughs> People think it's going to, oh, let's just do it, it's going to all be together. Yeah. But it's just not at all, because you've got to negotiate the future after that. And there's so much legislation still to come. So there are lots of opportunities for us to play around with that, if needs be. You know, the trade bill is still stuck in the laws. But it's got a customs union amendment attached to it now. It's quite handy. And actually, Philip Lee um, did a, when well, we had the Great Repeal Bill, um, I'll let you know this, he, um, he snuck an amendment through, which nobody really noticed very much at the time. But everybody voted for because they had to, because it was about uh, enjoying the benefits of the European Medicines Agency, so who's not going to sign up for that? Turns out you can't be in the European Medicines Agency unless you're in the union. It was a whip, so you realised afterwards when you got all these emails going, so Philip, can we talk about your amendment, please? No, it's fine. Um, so there are lots of opportunities, but without a doubt this week is a big one. Um, but I don't believe it will go through. I really don't. I'm just going to go for all the women now, sorry, Japs. Um, is it blue, so grey, and then I'll put them in purple. <laughs> Thank you, Penny Kite, uh, Great Shelford. I also work at the university uh, in teacher training. And obviously, I'm hugely concerned about the impact of policies on education in particular. And one of the things that has affected us in school, I was in schools for 40 years and at university too, is this appalling flip flop of policies between the two big parties, which impacts us horrifically when. One day we're told to do something and then someone else has bath and tells us to do something different. But in between, we hemorrhage money. The best <coughs> national curriculum I ever had in my hands, I had for three weeks prior to the election of the coalition government. And that night, 
on the DfE website that there was just the line that the national curriculum is cancelled. And that cost a phenomenal amount of money, time, expertise, and goodwill absolutely to produce. And it was gone and it was gone overnight. So I just really would encourage you, and I admire what you've done, I'm not a member of the Tory party in one either, I really admire what you're doing. And I would really encourage you in your evidence-based, research-based, uh, sort of building of coalitions, as frankly <coughs> other parliaments in other parts of the European Union do routinely to discuss issues and sort out issues and not try and sort out people. Okay. I, I agree with that totally. And it, it almost seems to me, you see it in the NHS as well, it's almost when you're a Secretary of State, I need to do something big so that you know I was here to prove that I have this job. And never mind all the people that work in that, um, in that area. So I agree totally. And that, that sort of grandstanding has to stop. And it's not to say that policies, you know, any, any party is going to want to change things if they can do a better job of it. But it needs to be moderate, slow, informed, talking to the people that it's going to affect to decide whether or not it's the right thing to do. But it's, it's building from expertise and, and evidence rather than just to say that I was here and I conquered. So I agree with that totally. Yeah. And then I'll put it over. Do you want to uh, grab the microphone? Um, I'm, I'm Vivian Biggs, I live in Fentroton. Um, highly, I'm so, 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 so excited about what you're doing. Um, I told you some months ago that I never voted for you as a Tory, and, and I would never have voted Tory, I never had my, never would. But now you have my vote. <laughs> I'm so delighted. Um, but what I, I have, I'm going on March next week. My daughter, who is 28, lives in London, is coming. She said she's going to make a banner, which is great. Um, but I have an anxiety about the, the, this whole idea of a people's vote because we gave that lovely vote referendum and it did what it did. And I worry a little bit about what happens because nobody really predicted what was going to happen. It was a shock on that morning. Um, so I do worry about that. Um, and I also worry, as I'm sure many people do, about what actually is the question on the vote. On the, on the paper. Because you know, that, that is fundamental. So, although it's, I really, I'm going to march next week and everything, I do have anxiety about it. And I believe that Jean Miller has indicated that she thinks it should be a last resort rather than anything else. You might be at the last resort, of course. Um, but, so I have my anxieties. Yeah, and I absolutely share all of them. If I'm honest, that's why I didn't go on march last time. And because, because it is a, it's the bazooka, isn't it? And it has to be last chance to do. And that's why when we pressed the vote this week, we knew we would lose it. There, there is a majority in the House that would support it, but only when every single other option has been exhausted. And the difficulty is, because the Prime Minister hasn't let go of the old paper and hasn't let us have these indicative votes across Parliament, right, who wants Canada? Who wants Norway? Who wants Norway Plus? Who wants people's vote? Because we haven't been allowed to have that. We haven't flushed out all the other options yet. And that's part of what we need to try and achieve this week. So I share all of those same worries with you. Um, the thing that helps me in my head kind of justify it, aside from the practical sign that if we fail miserably to coalesce around anything in Parliament, then that's all that's left, to be honest, which is kind of practically where you get to. Um, you know, if you get a chance to go back on Parliament TV and watch Sarah Wollaston's speech, which was um, day before yesterday, you know, she speaks as a, as a GP. Would you sign a piece of paper three years ago to say, chop off my leg? And then three years later, and now we're ready for you on the operating table. You got a bit of paper back then, that's still valid. I mean, you just wouldn't. You just wouldn't in any other woman. And this is where, unfortunately, this political... Um, a system such as we have it, we're scared of unleashing democracy. We're scared. But what on earth is scary about asking people three years later if they still feel the same way? Isn't that democracy personified? We do know significantly more now about what the deal will look like. Does and that apply to your own constituency? Yes, every four years. 
We, it, my, she, she has no mandate. Well, what, 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 <laughs> mandate. So, if you want to ask a question, whether well, the microphone comes down again, you're very well that you don't have a mandate. She doesn't have a mandate. My, it's, it's last time I agree with him totally. Um, but I'm not scared of democracy. Um, I are. think allowing, allowing people to exercise their view based on informed consent, that's how Sarah's adopter refers to it, then I think there's nothing wrong with that. But you have to check, for all the reasons that are evident today, you have to handle that with extreme caution. So I've never um, wanted people to vote. I've never been forceful at the front of the queue. I mean, Anna's been waving that banner forever. Precisely. Which is now, yeah. So we've, we've run out, we are running out of time, which is now we're getting into last time saloon territory. But yeah, it, it causes, it's not, um, not everybody's going to love it. I mean, he's really, really careful about how we use it. Right, any more questions? Why don't we stand in the row and then we're going to take it. Yeah. Uh, good luck, Heidi. Willie Kahn from Duxford. Um, we talked about values, and as your group coalesces, and as your big candidates for future elections, I'd like to raise a value which I think would be absolutely crucial, and it's standing up to something very dark that is spreading across Britain. Uh, the Little Street I live in, Duxford, after the referendum, the Lithuanian family and the French family, little kids planning to put down roots, both went independently. Um, the failure of Mrs. May to implement the Dobbs Amendment to bring refugee children who had a link to Britain already to let them languish uh, in shacks in France. Both my grandfathers were refugees and this was a sign that something very dark was happening, leaving kids cold and starving when they had a right to come to Britain, but they were foreign. They were migrants. The Windrush scandal, mm -hmm. all those Caribbean people who were treated abominably and had come to this country after the war at the request of Britain with British passports to help rebuild Britain. And uh, this, um, this sense that uh, the forum, the outsider, has to be kept down or kept away. How will your group stand up to that dark stain spreading across Britain? You're absolutely right, Woody. You know, I was, um, most people know, I was one of the hardest campaigners on the Dubs Amendment trying to get more refugee children to the number of the refugee camps. Um, it, it's, a, it's about the country you risk becoming. Very inward looking, I'm all right, Jack. To hell with everybody else. But that's not who we are instinctively as a country. I know it isn't. But like, you know, the ERG in my own party, it's them that shouts the loudest. Well, we need to start shouting loudly as well. And that's what a fresh start in politics is about, about re-energising who we are as a British people. We're not those people in yellow jackets. We're not those people saying keep the foreigners out. My goodness me, in this part of the country, how much value do we have from citizens that come from all over the world? We'd be stunned. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and although, as, as a political party, T can't only ever be just about Brexit, because no party deserves to succeed if it's just a one-item party. But are we global? Are we pro-European? Does every candidate who ever stands for us have to be absolutely 100%? It's fundamental. I'm Anne Robert, I'm 15. Um, I'd like to thank you for me uh, because you know, I have a lot of young people who feel um, very betrayed by Brexit and by like, society and politics at the moment. Um, and mm. the creation of the Independent Group has given us hope again, which I think is just amazing considering the state we are in. Um, how Brexit is not the only thing, and by looking at our politics, we are left for a future in a broken and crumbling country and society. Um, yesterday, I was marching with a thousand other young people. And I hope mean, other people don't march next week. But um, I was wondering what you would do to make young people feel like they have a voice again in politics in this country. Thank you. Because that's, it's another example, isn't it, of why 
why we can see the old political system is failing so badly. Mm. You know, I'll never forget, every time we went to any kind of tour we do, it's, how are we going to get more young people? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be tricky, I don't do badly, I don't do badly. Exhibit A. <laughs> um, but it's about um, any person, young people especially, it's about hope, isn't it? It's about a vision of something that I can be part of making, not just being the spectator and waiting for things to come down on me. And I hope some of the appeal, as I say, it's me and Harriet at the moment, and Andrew, and Penny, and Phil, and Simon, and Barbara and Howard, there's a few of us, but you need to help me. Yeah, that's the point. We are literally starting from an email account. So we have everything to do, and I hope by people being involved in things, they'll feel, and that's part of shaping it as well. You know, I want people, particularly when we get, they get our bus on the road, come along and help us shape, shape policies. If you're part of something, then that hopefully will make you feel that you're involved and your opinion is valued. Because, you know, we need to be making policies that work for you, not for them. Brilliant. Who have we got next? And then, uh, probably it takes me on this side, I can see three hands run out of Maybe just wherever you can see a hand. <coughs> Hi, David Walston, Triple O. Um, just quickly say I've never voted for you, but uh, you know I'm happy that now able to, and I know plenty of other people feel the same way. I was interested in you saying that everyone in the independent group is their equals. Um, you probably read Animal Farm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about who am I? Is it monster? No, you can tell me I'm a little pony. Yeah. Millie, Phil thinks I'm Millie. <laughs> <laughs> You know, at, at some point, one of you is going to have to become more equal than the others. So, <laughs> how, how are you going to choose who walks in two legs? <laughs> um, yeah, very good point. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a funny dynamic that I'm learning to, um, and it's interesting actually, as a, a group of ex Labour and Tories coming together. So, Anna and Particularly, Anna and I are like, come on, come on, business next, that's what we do. We're going to let what we're going to do. Um, whereas the Labour guys, so we need to have a vote on this. We need to have a vote on the side. And um, there's these two cultures coming together. To me, it is the leader, the obvious chucker. It needs to be our leader. Um, but Phil does push me a bit, says, well, maybe Heidi, one X, Tory, one X, um, um, Labour, one man, one woman. Maybe I should try and side look and be his deputy. I don't know. All of this is, is to work out. Because the other difference, of course, is we don't yet know who else is going to join us. So who might be a great leader for today for the personalities that we have right now might be unsuitable when we're twice or three times the size. But right here and now, I think it should be chuck out. Does that generally fit with people? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess the, the, the extra challenge for John, of course, is just have a baby, um, which is why we're going to take the priorities. But you know, while we're in this early stage, it's nice that we all work so well together. You know, I don't think cults didn't know existed. Because you're not supposed to talk to someone's office. Like, I'll tell you what, Mike, there is nobody who knows more about foreign, foreign policy than my day. It's absolutely encyclopedia. Um, but yes, we'll need to have these decisions. I think Chuck will have And then there are a couple more hands over on that side. Find a woman who plays Barbara, please. <laughs> I think you represented quite rightly. I was uh, pulled up on that. Hi, I'm Alston um, Triplo. Um, I suppose it's great to hear you talk about political parties as a business and making it the most efficient and taking notice for experts because that's how you make a successful business. So it seems like a very sensible idea and a way of promoting a successful party. What I you just mentioned the fact that you wanted to grow maybe two to three times, which obviously I would thoroughly support, and as my husband said, I've never voted for you, but very much would say it would in, in the future as well. But I wondered, what's your plan? How are you planning to grow from a very small party at home, not even a party at the moment, but how are you planning to get more people and therefore have more voice? So there are two dynamics to that. So there's one, the National Party, and, and me here locally. So here locally today, I'm unashamedly, if you haven't already emailed in, we'll catch your email addresses. We've got some forms at the back as you go out. If you want to be involved and help me, you know, practically getting those first leaflets out, all the rest of it, helping me when we need candidates, 
um, that type of thing, then I'd be really, really pleased to hear from people. Um, so that's very much the David part versus Goliath, because we need to build everything from scratch. But nationally, we've already got over 100,000 people signed up. Um, so I won't go into the figures, but we've got enough to be going on with financially. Um, we're very deliberately not attracting business donors yet, and any that do want to come, as, to, come to us with sizable um, sums of money, and there are a good number now, we are very squeaky clean. I want to know who you are, where you're registered, where the money comes from, we are getting into clean politics here. And I'm very, very firm on that, as indeed you all are. Um, so financially and membership-wise, we are building rapidly. You know, Twitter, we've got, I think, over 200,000 followers already. So that, that doesn't worry me, um, and I think there'll be another big hit. So more, more MPs practically, I'd be very surprised if we don't have someone come across to us uh, with a whole Brexit debacle. Because the factory lines in Labour now are almost as deep as the Ireland Party. Um, on the Tory side, it's a little bit more sensitive because too many of them would destabilise the government. If it takes away the majority control, then we're in general election territory and we don't want that. So we're a little bit cautious about how many Tories can come across. <laughs> We have to be because we don't have an election. Never mind for us, but for the country, the absolute worst thing to do. And then there's a dynamic with the Liberal Democrats as well. Um, so we don't want to force it, but I'm not worried in that regard. It's fair to say. Should we take, what do we reckon? Should we say four more questions? I think we should have this. There may be one dissenting voice in here. And, um, I think everyone congratulates you on your conviction for doing what you thought was right, which is admirable. Is admirable. But the problem is that I temper my admiration for you for, for the simple thing that you won't test your conviction. You had a mandate, personal mandate as a Tory. You don't have that mandate anymore. You have a personal mandate as the MP. Nothing more. So now, that you have to test that mandate. Now, I, it seems to be that you want to... The supposition is that you're going to stand in the next election in this constituency. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, absolutely. You will do? Yeah. Whatever happens, you will stand yes. in the next election. That's fantastic. That's absolutely clear. We have that on record. There's a temptation in politics to to, to swing and, and, and slide so that perhaps there will be a constituency that is really open to one of you ticks. It's possible that there is a, an area where the, um, the voting will be to your advantage. This is a Tory constituency. It's one of the safest of pleasures. When the next election is called, I will stand and then we'll see. There are an awful lot of people in here. Just a minute. There are an awful lot of people in here who are very supportive of you, but they never vote your Tory. But, there's, but, there's, but, there's, but, you, but you, you have, you, on that point, you have my, if I don't stand in South Cambridge, I don't stand anywhere. No, that's fabulous. That's, absolutely, that's great to hear. Because you will I don't test want it. to be anywhere else. I love it. Yeah. But you will test it, and that's, that's really good news. But you see, you see your, ana your analysis is completely wrong about so many things. But for example, you say the Tory party has changed. But you, you, by your own admission, didn't know anything about politics. You, you've only been in the Tory party for five years. You, you, you've been in party, you've been in Parliament for four years. You admit, by your own admission, you knew nothing about it. And then you say the Tory party has changed. But it's your views who have changed. I've got a whole list of statements that you've made that absolutely you contradict now. It's you that's changed. Rubbish. Rubbish! Right, he's right. He's right. He's right. He's right. He's right. He's right. So let me have the opportunity to respond. No, I just, I just, I quote, just, I quote you on lots and lots, I quote you on lots, lots and lots of things. So perhaps if I can have the opportunity. Oh, on Brexit, on Brexit. Barbara, take my phone. Thank you. Let me, let me have the opportunity to respond. I haven't really finished. <laughs> 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 I think I haven't finished. 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 I think I ha
just bullying you on. What's your question? And, and the point was, yeah, I just wanted to, the whole Get point this was to discuss things. There's been no discussion. Well, what do you think of the last occasion? I suppose the point is, I, and this is democracy. I run a meeting, I invite people. Who turn, I have a, so to give you an idea, my inbox, two and a half thousand emails from constituents telling me they were behind me and didn't want to buy a lot. Of 41 who didn't, he was the, the other way. I, I can't, this isn't Russia, I don't force the right people to come to a meeting, it is as it is. But in response to, your, the, I think the, the heart of your question was about whether I'm right to say the Tory party's change as opposed to me. You don't have to be in an organisation for 20 years. You don't need to be in a relationship for 20 years to see whether the person in front of you has changed or not. In a very short time, and th this is what's so extraordinary, the party has been hijacked. And I think the referendum result was a big part of that. But the other big indication, the 2017 election was an unmitigated disaster. That manifesto that we stood on, half of it hasn't been delivered. When I campaigned, the things I was campaigning for, the values I was sharing with constituents about things that are important to me, I didn't use any of the central office. If you ever, if you ever noticed or compared my literature to any other toy candidate in the area, I, didn't, I designed all my own. I didn't use a single thing that came out of conservative purpose. So I am confident. I have to look myself in the mirror to do this. You know, doing, doing what I've done is not an easy decision, and I, I have to be very, in my head, I have to be very, very clear you can't lie to yourself about whether you think you're acting with integrity or not. And I am 100% convinced I have seen the party change in front of my eyes. I would not have joined it. I could have picked any seat anywhere, like a normal MP, but I wanted to be in the heart of science and technology, and I believed the Conservative Party, as was, matched me in my values. It has changed. We've heard it from Conservative voters from Ron here in the room. It has changed beyond all recognition. And, and we have tried to convince the Prime Minister to come back to the centre ground. Well, we have a Foreign Secretary at the time who was allowed to say F business mm -hmm. and not be reprimanded. That says that that kind of behaviour goes and that's okay. And that is a different party to the one that I joined. more questions um, and then I'll be around if you want to mill at the end um, but I'm just going to plug it again if you'd like to put the four so gentlemen and blue top I'm Bruce Hill from Elder I agree with yeah, a, a lot of the, the, the tone of what we're talking about that uh, politics currently is pretty abysmal and certainly we're not looking after vulnerable as we should that's a given um, and I, I, I get what you're trying to do in principle. I've got no uh, loyalty to any party. I think they're all pretty appalling, actually. Um, but there is something in what this fellow is saying, that you, you have got a nice, easy ride here. And there are some questions which do need easy to be... Ride. In here. It's a small suicide. How is that an easy ride? It's right. I'm not going to say that. Well, to be fair, she's been paid very generously by taxpayers for next year. So, you know, I, I, I wish you were... Yeah. It's her job. It is. I don't want to have an argument with everyone. Yeah, I, I wish you well to some extent what you're doing, but you're right, this is a job, you've been paid handsomely for it. Um, there, there are some contradictions, and one, one that I'd like to pick up on is your enthusiasm for democracy as you see it in terms of a second referendum. There's not enthusiasm for that, it's an acceptance of the matter of that, as I was explaining to this woman here. But your lack of enthusiasm for by election, I, I can't oh, reconcile that currently. Really yeah, and, and you could argue the Prime Minister as well, meaning vote one, meaning vote two, meaning we'll vote three. But you're you know? not this. This is what you're telling us. You're not that. So here's, an, so here's another dimension, and I, I do believe genuinely, fundamentally, that what I campaign on, my values, everything I said I do, the way I represent my constituents, absolutely none of that has changed. But my ability, um, when we look at the party nationally and its priorities, it's like signing up for a contract and suddenly the service you're getting is completely different from that which you were promised. How the Conservative Party is behaving nationally is not how it was. It's now saying no deal. The party of business is advocating no deal. We look at the, the utter chaos in the voting lobbies um, yesterday. Steve Barclay, I commend the statement to the House and then goes and votes the other way. So, 
that the, the party is not behaving on the basis that it was. It is all over the place. It is rudderless, and it is not with that which I joined. So I am very, very comfortable in my own skin on that. 100% it has changed. But the other more practical thing, if 11 of us suddenly create by-elections now, on the eve of the biggest votes that will determine our country's future for generations and generations, I'm not actually sure that the British public will thank us for that, because our vote needs to be in that <laughs> I'm going to let you choose the last person. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go right to the back. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, uh, David Brock and I live in Falmere. Um, uh, Heidi, uh, I want to congratulate you on crossing the floor of the House. Uh, many great politicians have done it in the past. Some of the greatest politicians uh, that we ever had and who are generally reckoned to be such as um, Winston Churchill, who did it twice. Uh, and I would also just like to say that I hope that we will find more politicians of all parties who vote according to their beliefs and to their consciences. Yes. And to find politicians who vote and understand that they are representatives and not delegates. Yeah. Yeah. Should we do one more for you, I think? I feel like I've got away scot-free there. A few hands at the front here. I'm Chris Okay. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to ask, with your business background, and with living in South Camden, which is Put the microphone to your mouth. I was just a bit of a heavily influenced by high-tech companies, but... Still can't hear. You put the microphone near your mouth. I'll repeat the gist of it, perhaps, if that's helpful. Um, something that has concerned me in the past is coming with what you buy by big companies who have, are purely interested in, in self interest and are throwing money, huge amounts of money, to get their own way. With you, you having a business background, are you going to deal with the sort of companies who are going to come to you with huge amounts of money and are going to try and influence you? Not necessarily the best way. Yeah, and that's a really valid question. So the gist of it, if you didn't all catch it, is how do we resist being lobbied by big business with big cash base to influence our policy and how we behave? Well, that's why it's so important. You know, because people like David Miliband and people like that have been hovering around the edges and big business, and we have. You know, when the um, the Labour MPs went on that Monday, they paid for the hire of that room in the press conference themselves at their own pockets. We have been determined from the beginning. We are owned by nobody. Nobody. Once we've got our values and our constitution in place, if you want to donate, you're very welcome. But it's no strings attached. And we've been absolutely crystal clear on that. We've built it into our, um, our HR all documentation, everything we're putting together for constitution, standing orders. Um, so if you're, if you're happy to contribute, that's wonderful. But it's on our terms. And we've, we've been very clear that we've been turning this on our heads. Quite often, things are driven by big donors, big opinion, big businesses. And that gets you in a mess, because it means that you're owned from the beginning. And, and another reason, different dynamic, but why it's important that we don't all become the dumb, for example, because this is about new. There's no yesteryear, this is about doing things differently. And I will be particularly hot on that. You know, for business here, here locally, if AstraZeneca have an opinion about Brexit, I want to hear it. But it doesn't mean that they own me. And, and that, you know, that's what's so important in the type of candidates and the sort of people we allow to become representatives of table, whatever we become. That those standards have to apply to every single one of us. Anybody that is motivated by that, they're in the wrong party. And we'll be very, very firm on that. Because otherwise we'll get the same message as everybody else. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very, very much for coming. Everybody who's helped me with today, um, we're going to get some forms at the back of the room with the various volunteers. Um, and if you um, are interested in joining us, if you don't have time today, then by all means do email me. I think you've all got the anything that ends with hideyallen.co.uk that hasn't got MP in the address um, is the email to get in touch with. And um, as always, send me your questions, anything I can help with. Um, and thank you very, very much for coming on today.